So, hello everyone and welcome to the first um, uh, webinar of the Tell Advisors uh, Special Interest Group. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, mopping up, aligning policy and practice. So basically looking at minimum online presence um, in our various institutions. Now just a, a couple of quick things. So you'll see that there's uh, an image up on the screen here with some basic introductions, uh, in, instructions about how to use uh, Collaborate Ultra. The way that we're going to run this session is we've got three speakers, they'll all talk for about 10 minutes. So they'll talk for 10 minutes, answer questions for five minutes specifically relating to their projects or what they've discussed. And then at the end we'll have Kate um, as the final speaker, uh, sort of kind of giving a bit of a, a lit review, I guess, of what's happening in the sector. And then we'll sort of have a broader discussion. So we'll try and keep this pretty much to time. So we'll be cracking the whip slightly. Um, yeah, so obviously everyone seems to have discovered the chat window pretty well. Um, for the most part, we've found that turning off your microphone if you're not talking is generally a good thing. So there's just the icons at the bottom of the screen. Um, can you, and yeah, can we think, is there anything else um, that I've missed here? Or should we just get into it? All right, let's go. Um, so the first presenter is Lene Benaruzzo from Western Sydney University. Over to you, Lene. Uh, do you have slides or something? Yes, I do. Um, and I believe I can share content. Is that, is that right? Sorry. That's right, yeah. So just a little share content icon at the bottom right there. Okay, all right. Sorry, I should have had that ready. Uh, just bear with me for a second. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, presenter rights. So is that working? Uh, it's just converting now. Oh, okay. Yeah, it does that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Oh, I'm now a moderator. I feel like I've been promoted. <laughs> It's all about power. All right, it still says it's converting. Yeah, so I think what they do is they convert the slides into images. So I have a feeling that any fancy transitions or animations or whatever probably won't work. That's um, all right. I've kept it really simple. I've only got six slides. Um, and it's loading five or six, loading complete. Um, share now. So can you see, oops. I just stopped the other thing. So there might be two share now buttons. Um, no, I've only got one. Select a slide to navigate. You should be seeing um, Western Sydney Blended Learning Standards. Yep, there we are. Yes, okay, it's truncated the heading a little bit, but anyway, um, sorry about that. Uh, are you good for me to start? Yeah, please. All right, put my timer on. Uh, so hi everybody, my name is Lene Benarut. So I'm the Blended Learning Manager at Western Sydney University. And uh, I'm really grateful to be able to come and share some of the experiences that we've been um, employing at Western particularly around standards. And I have two standards um, to show you and also talk about where we're going, how we're evolving our standards. So I thought it would be um, useful to give a little bit of a context as to where we've been and where we are. So um, this is the continuum that we've been working on. It's be very similar to where, um, to where you may also be in your institution. So we, um, in 2012, we had a very large blended learning strategy that um, encompassed the blending of a thousand undergraduate units in um, a three-year period and the employment of school-embedded blended learning advisors and designers. 
So that was a whole of institutional uh, strategy to blend um, our, our units, if you like. In 2014, we, some of our schools were completely removing uh, lectures and they were taking a more sort of program level approach to flipping um, their curriculum. Uh, and we've also had some schools who are doing work in the fully online space. So the standards that I'm about to talk to you about encompass those three sort of red-hued um, spheres there that they can be applied to blended, flipped or fully online. The first of our standards is the basic standards. So we have four standards and you'll see them here. They're uh, organisation and appearance. And this looks at the site design, where you find important information, such as the unit outline, etc. Um, and uh, the second one is about consistency and compliance. So this is copyright, privacy, all the policies, making sure that what's in the blended environment the, in terms of the activities that students are doing is consistent with what's in their unit outline or their learning guide. The third one is about the appropriate use of tools, technologies and apps. Uh, and that specifically focuses on making sure that there are expectations uh, and that the tool matches or is aligned to the activity. Um, the reason for this one in particular is that we were doing a lot of work across the institution and found that staff or academics were adding tools and then expecting that students would know automatically what to do with those. And we know that's not, that's not the case. Uh, and the fourth standard looks at learner resources and supports. So these are the explicit supports resources that are provided to students um, that may be relevant to the discipline. So there might be a handbook or there might be links to um, professional bodies, etc. But it also encompasses the very basic accessibility, disability, links to welfare services, counselling, etc., etc. So there are 21 criteria across those basic standards and how we've designed them, and I'm very happy to share them. They're Creative Commons, you can use them as you want. Um, the, the, correct, the way the document's being prepared or the standards are being prepared is a self-rating checklist. So you can go through and identify whether you're meeting it or not meeting it or you're working towards it. And we've also placed a fair amount of um, information there in terms of development strategies. So as an academic or as an educational designer, if you're working with an academic and they want to know, well, how do I make sure my... Um, I'm using the tools appropriately, then there's developmental strategies, links to resources, links to examples, etc., cetera, that, um, that people can use. So we find that these basic standards are very well um, received. We get about 85% consistency across the organisation. So we do do some measurement on that and reporting up to deputy deans. The second set of standards that we've got, so where the basic standards focused on the design and the very basic principles um, of a learning environment, the advanced standards focus more on the pedagogy. Um, and these ones, again, I'm happy to make available to you. These look at some prompting questions for designing uh, a blended or an online course that really looks at what are the activities and the materials and the technology that you're going to be using and are they aligned to the learning outcomes? Um, what sort of assessment are you going to do and how is feedback going to be embedded in that? And how are you going to use data to inform your future designs? We also have a specific area around the student interaction and the engagement. So it's again providing lots of opportunities for very meaningful engagement, engagement between students and also with students and their instructor. And like the basic standards, we have a section which is really about the quality resources and supports. So again, this is more about the literacy support and um, the, the academic sort of support for students as opposed to the basic standards one. So that's what we've been doing. Um, the basic standards have been ones that we can measure quite well. The advanced standards aren't as easily measurable, but they're useful in the design phase. 
So where we're up to now is we're looking at Quality Matters, which is an international rubric originally developed at the University of Maryland. Uh, and there are elements of this rubric that touch on the basic and the advanced standards. But what's really nice about this is that it encompasses a little bit more um, and it has a, a nice um, points score where you can go through a review process and identify whether um, some units are actually meeting more of the standards or not. So we're doing some work in this space um, at the moment and to show you what uh, to show you what they look like, and sorry, you can't see them that well there. There are eight standards and 43 um, uh, sub or specific review standards. And um, so again, these look at uh, the alignment between the um, learning outcomes at the unit level, the learning outcomes at the module level, making sure they're very well aligned and then the alignment continues to the materials, the assessment tasks and the learning activities. So that's all I've really um, prepared and wanted to talk about because I thought it would be useful uh, to field any questions. Um, and is that okay with you, Colin and Kate? That's fantastic. Um, well, I, I guess I have a couple of questions. I mean, just looking at this set of standards, so I see that the different standards have points values that are allocated. So does that mean that, so is there an expectation that a course achieves a certain points value and it doesn't matter which way they get there? Or how, how I, I guess, I mean, how, yeah, what, what are you doing in terms of compliance? I guess that's what it boils down to. Excellent question. And it's one we're thinking about at the moment. So we've just gone through some training in the QM rubric and the peer review certification process. Um, so I've just been successfully through that, so I'm now a peer, certified peer reviewer of the QM rubric. And the way in which the points are scored, so if you see anything that has a three, that's considered essential to a quality course or quality unit. But the showstopper, if you like, would be around um, 2.1 and 2.2, which is about the alignment of measurable learning outcomes with the activities and the assessments and what have you. So they're the ones, if, if it, as long as it meets 85%, um, then you could say that it does meet the QM standards. Um, but the big showstoppers would really be around the alignment of the learning activities resources, technologies um, with the learning outcomes. Cool. So there's a couple of questions here in the chat. Um, okay. So I'm just, just scanning through. So it looks like Kate's going to talk a little bit about, bit more about quality matters at the end. Excellent. And then just asking how did the implementation go and what was the process for rolling it out? Uh, for the QM or for the basic and advanced standards? Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> both. <laughs> both. Okay, excellent. Um, well, with the QM, we've just um, convened a group we're calling the QM Lunch Bunch. We're going to be working over pizzas to look at what do our staff need to be able to um, apply the QM rubric in their course. In some ways, there might be some templates or some university supplied information around accessibility, learner supports, etc., that they can customise. But we also want to look at some activities that they can, student engagement activities that they can build in. Um, and we also recognise that we have to do a fair bit of work around writing measurable learning outcomes. So that's where we are with quality matters at the moment. The basic standards and the advanced standards, we initially did that work in 2009, so there was a working party that worked on that. Then we then had a steering committee, which was a, which was of executive, um, to take it up to them because really we were saying as an institution, we want to make this, and we put it in policy, that 100% of all um, learning management sites um, would would apply the basic standards and we were aiming to get to 100% but we didn't. Um, so how we measured that was we would go through a random sample of 10, um, 10 or 30% of sites per semester of undergraduate and postgraduate and we would um, go through the learning guides and go through the learning management sites to look for uh, consistencies. 
and we would then put reports together, aggregated across schools, across the institution, develop strategies that could be used to improve consistencies. And it did highlight areas that as an institution we needed to um, address. For example, copyright. Copyright was something we weren't doing particularly well, some schools better than others. So we would work with the library to come up with some specific strategies and activities to help raise awareness, make the processes much more streamlined. So we looked after the audits and the compliance. We didn't call it either of those words. We called it consistency mm. checks and we found that that was um, a much more friendly term that didn't put people um, off. How big is your team? <laughs> Team's quite small at the moment. We've only got four. Uh, five including myself. We had one person who looks at um, the measurement side of things. So that person looked after basic standards analysis and um, the advanced standards. We didn't do any measurement. We worked with staff to be able to understand how to apply it. And with the quality matters, we're not at the stage yet of figuring out how we're going to implement that. Yet yeah, nobody, nobody likes compliance. <laughs> I have I answered your question? Just, there was just one quick question there, I think, from Wendy about how you how you measure current tech, and then, then maybe we'll move on to Leanne. Yeah, for sure. So, how we measure current technology at the university? We have a digital learning technology toolkit, um, and what we did is we worked with our blended learning advisors and designers in the schools to find out what technologies and apps they were using. Uh, to support blended learning and then we collated and, and refined that list to come up with those technologies that um, we would recommend. Ultimately we want to make sure that the student experience is consistent so they don't have one technology in one unit versus another technology that kind of does the same thing in another unit. And we also looked at some support resources both in terms of technology and pedagogic support. Um, and strategies for really leveraging those technologies. But we also wanted to look and highlight at those technologies that um, were university provided, like the learning management system. Okay. Um, just in the interest of, of keeping things going, um, I think there are a couple more questions, but um, I think that there will be time at the end of the session. So that was that, that's great, and I think we'll be stealing your stuff, Lenae. So <laughs> you're more than welcome to. I mean, we're moving to into quality matters, but the basic standards and the advanced standards. We did a lot of work. It took us at least a year to develop both standards. Um, so feel free to send me any questions if you want a copy of the basic standards and the advanced standards. I'll put them in the chat room window for you. Um, but feel free to email me any, every, anything, any questions. And I'm sorry that I do have to leave at 3.30 because it sounds like there's a really good group of people here who have uh, got some expertise and experience that I could benefit from as well. Absolutely. And I, well, I think one of the other things that we can do is in the Moodle Cloud course that we've got set up, we'll have a topic uh, in the discussion forum because I think this is certainly something that we can keep talking about for some time. So, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So now, um, Dr. Leanne Yo from Deakin, um, you take it away, Leanne. Thanks, Colin. Um, yeah, that, that that was fantastic, Lene. Um, it was very well documented in terms of the type of standards that you have. Now, I'm just gonna just see whether I can share my application. Just give me a sec. To just an application. And I won't, probably won't do that. Give me a sec. Okay. 
All right, so it's slowly converting at the moment. So I might as well just start. Um, I've only got a few few slides. Um, so at Deakin, um, essentially we've been offering distance education for quite some time and we essentially all our units at Deakin have an online presence, a cloud presence at Deakin. Our cloud Deakin is what we call our umbrella term to all our um, online learning environment and educational technologies that we have at Deakin. We've reviewed our minimum standards per se. Um, I know others would prefer to call it quality indicators, etc. in the last year or so. Now, we don't have it really nicely documented and laid out like um, Lene's work, which is fantastic. I think that's something that we could work towards on within Deakin. Um, so essentially my role, I'm, I lead the learning innovations team within the Faculty of Business and Law. So we do have a central team within our university, uh, Deakin Learning Futures, which uh, Chia works in there as well. So we work very closely together on that. In terms of our minimum standards for our cloud Deakin presence, it's very simple in terms of its layout. It's very bare minimum baseline, and it does focus on uh, site design and navigation and layout. I've uploaded my slides. I'm just trying to get it to share, and I don't know whether I can. Um, Colin, are you able to click on to the um, PowerPoint presentation? It's already uploaded and converted. Looks like it's still processing. Okay, okay this looks. That's fine. No, no, I'm nearly there. Yep, yeah, that's fine. So I think she has just shared the link to our, I think, one or two page. Um, standards at the moment and like I said uh, it does focus on our site structure and layout going forward so it does look at in terms of the type of goals in terms of having information that we have there about assessment and feedback and unit guide information we do focus on learning resources having consistency logical structure the type of technical and study support information that, that's there. We also have another category on learning experiences in terms of how we interact and communicate with students. And obviously about the people, about the contact details of the unit teaching team and looking at ways that we can engage our students in the cloud as well using welcome videos. Now what we don't have going forward, like what Lene has, is obviously um, further down in terms of what it actually means um, essentially with all these standards. Now, this is an opportunity for us to go off and have a look at exemplars and giving examples and gathering that for our staff and students as well. So we have university level site minimum standards. Each of the faculties at the moment, um, especially within my faculty of business and law, we contextualize the university minimum standards. And further to that, in our courses or others may use the word program, we then contextualize that further for the actual program, making sure that we meet obviously the faculty and the university minimum standards going forward. So to give you an example, one of our learning experiences um, section where, um, where we've just updated for our faculty was that every single unit in our uh, faculty had to offer a minimum three synchronous cloud-based session for cloud students. And for us, um, so my other role in, um, in the faculty, I'm one of the deputy course directors of the um, Bachelor of Commerce, which is our biggest program at Deakin. We've taken that further as well and to allow all our eight core units in our program to deliver live streamed classes. And also on top of that, um, have weekly cloud-based sessions as well. So you can see that each of the courses going forward, they can contextualize it and have and add more to the minimum that is there as well. So essentially that's what it is, what we have. Um, in terms of, I think the, what I would talk about more is about the process and the support mechanism that's in place. So with us, um, we, I'm happy to say that at Deakin, we have a really strong support um, approach to the way we provide teaching and learning support across uh, the university. And with our minimum standards, 
we don't really like the word minimum standards, but when that was um, re-looked at a couple of years back, it wasn't really looking at um, really a top-down approach. It was a midway, halfway, bottom-up approach in a sense. And it was focused on continuous improvement and capacity building. We were looking at identifying areas, units, staff members, where there are areas where we can help them, support them, and enhance what they do. So that's the approach that we take along the way. Now, the work um, on the, these minimum standards was a collaboration between all the faculties. We have four faculties. Um, it was a collaboration between all four central team as well and other um, experts as well, such as the library, you have language services and careers, etc. as well involved. We had student consultations. We also worked with departments. So it was quite a lengthy process in that. Um, and I must admit that it's been quite positive, very positive. And what we find that anything in terms of introducing new standards or new technologies towards our approach, it's that scaffolded support that's really important. So yes, we had strong leadership. Yes, we had um, a lot of support from the ground as well. Uh, the scaffolded support, so we listened, um, you know, from all folks, you know, staff and students as well. We have cloud resources to support staff members and also the capacity building sessions. So we have central, we have faculty, school based and any customized based sessions for our courses as well. What we also do is provide at the elbow support. So to give you an example with that um, synchronous sessions that we introduce as a bare minimum for our faculty, obviously we didn't just go ahead and add that in without support. So we had, um, we provided faculty cloud synchronous sessions, uh, school-based and obviously course and unit team-based sessions as well. Now, it wasn't just focusing on the technology, we also provided support on the delivery of the actual, um, the unit and also the course as well. So we've been taking them like, like any other higher education, so the focus is on the program, the whole course in total. And obviously drilling that down further to the unit um, within, our, um, our faculty. So, so far at the moment, um, areas of improvement and what we can work on, um, I guess going forward is, we love to see, you know, like Lene's area in terms of things being more documented down going forward. That's lovely in that as aspect. The part that, um, that I haven't yet spoken about is that a couple of years back, there was a three year massive project within Deakin where we, what we call the course enhancement process, where there, there was around $20 million invested into that and every single course within Deakin was looked at in terms of reviewed from the course learning outcomes all the way to the design, the delivery, um, their assessment, and the actual support at the end as well. So we've been through that process. Um, and at the moment, staff members at Deakin Essentially, they know in terms of changes, meeting standards, um, not just meeting standards, but exceeding standards, wanting to do more um, for our students. It's, it's our culture at the moment. Um, sometimes, you know, we get asked, you know, do you have disgruntled staff members? Do you have pushback, etc.? cetera? Um, I can say for sure that from our faculty business and all, we've had all that hard, difficult, complex conversations at the moment. We're just moving forward but obviously moving forward and um, supporting our staff members. The support is absolutely the most, um, I believe the most important aspect of this and getting the right people um, and supporting our staff members and providing scaffolded follow-up support for us. I think that's all I have to say at this point. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Leanne. Keeping it to time just beautifully. Um, yeah. Uh, what have we got? So how do you provide virtual support for staff? Yeah, virtual support. We, we, um, we've we signed up with Microsoft, I think, a few years back. So everyone has Skype for Business and OneDrive, um, everyone, like as in staff and students. So for us in our faculty, um, and, and I can talk more generally at the university level as well. So at the university, we have a division called eSolutions. They have help desk support, they support students, et cetera. And they also support the learning spaces somewhat as well. Um, there is, each of the faculties have a teaching and learning support team, which consists of between five to eight staff members. 
and we we provide virtual as in Skype for business support as well where we can share our screens um, and it's typically nine to five um, the type of support that we provide and we have drop-ins as well staff members can just walk in our learning spaces down here and just come in and ask for help if they feel that you know their help requires a bit more 30 minutes an hour it's typically quite flexible they arrange it with one of our team members you know in their office or in the learning space and we can provide support for that as well Hi, uh, Leanne. Thank you so much. Um, just a couple of other questions in here. Uh, Sue asks, who provided training for staff in OneDrive? I'm guessing she is asking which team or, you know, is it centrally supported? Yeah. Look, um, I think at the moment um, we are looking, see, um, the support for OneDrive at the moment, I think to answer that, a range of people can provide that support. So essentially the documents and the actual documents, online documents are written by our um, e-solutions, our, you know, the university's equivalent IT um, central team. But having said that, um, so there's, you know, the basic functions and features of OneDrive. But looking at how to actually use OneDrive as part of your teaching and enhancing the student learning, that's where the faculty teams can come in and also assist with that and work with units or course directors on that as well going forward. So you'll find that in the teaching learning support teams, you have a mix of academics and educational technologists who provide that support. Terrific. Um, I might ask another one. Uh, just, uh, it sounds like with uh, such a large team uh, that you know you really need that um, support across teams and and maybe even high level support. How important do you think uh, getting high level uh, strategic sponsorship or strategic direction and some of that core infrastructure is in just uh, being able to implement this kind of approach? Yeah. Look absolutely important you know you need leadership we you know i'm happy to say that we have bev oliver she's fabulous um and she's a people person as well you know she's very understandable you know really um easy in terms of receiving feedback and comments from everyone she's very open and we also have william confinary our cio who's i think one cio of the year worldwide just recently twice i think so i think with those two folks at deacon we're very lucky C William having sorting out the infrastructure in place, Bev being very, you know, future thinking in the education sector. And then obviously it goes all the way down to the faculties, the ADTLs, the Associate Deans of Teaching and Learning. And generally it's the culture, it's the, um, you know, the att attitude of our staff members. I think that's really key. And, and like I mentioned earlier in terms of within our faculty at least, and I'm pretty sure it's in the other three faculties, that the conversation of, you know, not wanting to move ahead with technology or trying out new things, that's just, that's yesterday. You know, it's at the point, and, and I'll be honest, and I'll say it, and I've heard it many times, if you're not comfortable with that, given that all the support that we have, if you don't agree where, where our faculty is moving, where our deacons plan to go ahead with our strategic plans, then maybe deacons not the right place. I'm being honest with that, and um, we offer a lot of support um, compared to other I, at the moment compared to other universities. So we are very flexible, um, and the scaffolded support is really important. And generally, at the moment, I can say that uh, within my faculty, at least, and I'm sure with the other faculties, we're pretty happy with where we're going. That's yeah, that's just really refreshing to hear that kind of yeah. a, a, a top level and, attitude yeah. across the institution. Oh, absolutely. Um, and um, they're really open. Our um, our senior execs, they're very open to feedback and comments and they act on that, you know, and that's where, you know, where I've written on these slides, it's not just a top down approach. It's that meeting halfway, bottom up. This is what students want. This is students feedback to us. They want something consistent, you know, et cetera, et cetera, along the way. Um, staff members at the same time. And I think with my role at the moment, I play multiple hats. So Yes, I'm the deputy course director of our biggest program at Deakin, but I also teach as well. And I'm also a student and plus, you know, I'm in academic development. So I have multiple hats on, so I can see all of that. And I and I can happily say that Deakin at the moment, yeah, we are supported and, and with any introduction of new technologies, having the infrastructure there, making sure that it works well. And yes, at times it does fail, 
but providing staff members and students that there are reassurances of follow-up support and that there is a, a hand, two hands, three hands if you want, to hold them along the way. So from start to finish. So we don't just advise them, this is what you need to do with new technology, but we actually work with them from start all the way to the end as well. So that's that's what yeah, that's what we provide. That's fantastic. All right. Um, I might um, keep moving. Um, so thanks again, Leanne, for your time and for the great work that you're doing. Um, also, Tom's just posted a quick question, but I think this is possibly something that we might be able to cover um, in the general conversation at the end because it seems like a pretty universal um, question. So if you don't mind, Tom. Um, so with fi our final speaker, is Kate Mitchell, who's um, one of the leaders of this SIG and something of a dynamo, makes it all happen. Um, and she's from La Trobe and she'll be talking about sort of what's happening in broader terms. Thanks, Colin. Okay. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me. It looks like that's happening. Um, and I think, Colin, you're putting up my slides? Or do it? Yep. Or do I need to do those? Uh, hopefully that's happening. Uh, let me know if I need to put them up. So, oh yep, beautiful, terrific. Okay, so uh, I thought I'd use this opportunity just to, uh, as part of what we've been looking at at La Trobe, we're at a point where we have, uh, I guess, a minimum online presence, uh, similar to, to Deakin in that it, it has some core um, minimum you know, pieces that should be in the LMS for students. But beyond that, it you know, we haven't gotten down to standards the same way that uh, Western Sydney University has. But I guess we're thinking about moving towards that approach and uh, also looking at how do we tie those things together with some other strategies that are happening and, you know, building good support uh, resources and, and other components for staff. So some of the work has involved you know, looking at existing uh, standards out there from other universities. So I thought that it would be a good chance to just take everyone through some of the things I'd found through that process and then open it up to the, the group to discuss a bit further and, and raise you know, questions and, and ideas amongst the team. So uh, just a quick, there we go, it's still coming up. Oh, yep. So a little bit about me, like a couple of other Kates out there, I play the ukulele and I have a food intolerance. So just uh, so you know that about me and you have a sense of who I am. Uh, in terms of the review that I've uh, had a look at and that uh, a few of us here in our team have had a look at, uh, we went through and found uh, online, there are a number of st standards and policies out there. So this review the, is just really some key findings and, and things that um, we found. Uh, encompassed, you know, La Trobe, Federation Uni, Griffith, RMIT, uh, Western Sydney, uh, which Lene uh, demonstrated prior, uh, Wollongong, UWA, James Cook, and then a few international. Uh, so part of what I'll do is talk a little bit about quality matters as well, uh, just because I did some training recently through the rubric. So the key findings in terms of, especially around the uh, institutions that were taking more of just a minimum uh, online presence were, there was a, a lot of variability across, you know, some that had similar to La Trobe, uh, you know, very basic minimum online presence all the way up to much uh, larger standards or benchmarking or strategies. But in terms of the ones that had some sort of benchmarking or standards similar to Western Sydney, they seem to fall under these key categories. So organisation design and orientation, um, accessibility and usability, learning resources and content, activities and engagement, assessment uh, and evaluation, policy and compliance and learner support. So uh, in terms of what that means, uh, in terms of organisation and design, it seemed to be around, uh, you know, have you organised your subject or unit clearly? Have you provided uh, some kind of orientation and welcome both to the subject, but also to, I guess, online learning and making sure that students could find where that, you know, the key information that they needed to find uh, and where to go so that they knew where to start. Um, media formats and things around, uh, 
clarity and size, particularly around resources. So using a range of media formats, um, aligning your content to your learning objectives. So alignment seemed to come up a lot across the categories. Uh, so in assessment and evaluation, alignment, clarity, uh, so clarity of language, clarity of, of wording and activity types that you are asking students to engage in uh, and um, some other key things around policy and compliance, and, which is you know, probably no surprise, and learner support, which learner support uh, is, I guess, where Leanne mentioned the other teams often fit in. So academic support, ICT or technological support, uh, building support structures with other teams and, and directing students to where to get help with uh, either the system or with their studies or just you know knowing what their uh, rights and responsibilities are. So it seemed that a lot of them, the, uh, the institutions tended to cover these categories. Um, probably the, the ones that were a little bit different were Fed, uh, Federation Uni seemed to, seemed to have a four-tiered approach, which was uh, looking at some core uh, standards, but also some pedagogical approaches and some uh, then some customization for faculty level, which was quite similar to um, what uh, Leanne was talking about. So uh, they had a, a space for additional levels of uh, standards to be placed in at a, a faculty or a college or you know that departmental level. Some other approaches uh, that especially internationally uh, that I've seen uh, that Lene mentioned one and I've just recently undertaken the course on is Quality Matters and that's uh, from University of Maryland, I think, or Maryland Online, sorry, not university, they're a non-profit uh, and they implement a rubric that is aligned to several standards. Uh, so what they, as uh, Lene mentioned, they have, um, there's, you know, I think there was 36 or something uh, standards and, and they come under you know seven eight key categories uh, so they're larger standards but with some you know sub standards within that uh, the key thing that comes out with quality matters is this uh, piece around alignment so where they differ to say some of the other institutional approaches is around the fact that alignment actually uh, becomes its own, it's worked into all of the standards, but it also, or, or most of the standards, but it's also its own standard in its own right. So standard two, uh, it very much talks about uh, alignment and the fact that there need to be learning objectives at the uh, subject level and at a modular level, so that, you know, you've got weeks or modules that uh, make explicit the learning objectives that uh, you know part of that module that then feed into the larger uh, subject outcomes or objectives so and part of that process of uh, reviewing a subject or a, a unit based on that approach is that if they're not uh, listed and they're not measurable uh, then the actual review process can't continue you have to go back to the uh, academic or coordinator and and try and get further information or some work done in order to evaluate that subject. So that was a piece that I thought was quite uh, interesting and, and a, a nice approach in terms of really thinking about how do you uh, build in the pedagogical structures. So uh, talking about, you know, in, in tertiary usually constructive alignment and, and trying to make sure that you know, your learning outcomes map to your assessments and map to all of your activities and content. And uh, it seemed that the fact that that was quite explicit and, and gave some really constructive uh, approaches on how someone should should aim to do that uh, was, was quite different to the way that maybe other uh, institutional standards currently work. The, uh, I guess the other pieces that I found interesting with something like Quality Matters were the fact that uh, the annotations around the rubric are very, very clear and the peer review process that goes with if you're trying to get accredited is uh, quite a constructive and positive process or appears to be quite a, a constructive and positive process. So uh, the, the piece that I guess uh, I'm always concerned about and we brought up before was around um, 
you know, audits and, and not wanting to say that something's an audit, but how do you uh, get quality and effectively evaluate uh, subjects and, and aim to improve. And the peer review process is, is very much around providing what uh, Quality Matters calls uh, helpful recommendations, which have some very, um, clear characteristics within those recommendations that they're specific, measurable, uh, sensitive, balanced and constructive. And so they essentially are written in a way that uh, that an academic could actually implement those and be seen to have clearly actioned that and then resubmit that subject and gain a MET and therefore be accredited. So it's not meant to be a punitive process. It's not meant to be, um, you know, it's meant to be quite clear and object, you know, objective and, and clear and actionable for, for staff so that they actually understand how they can improve their subject design and and the ways in which to do that and that there are there is clear evidence involved in that. So I think that was a really nice way to look at um, the process of how do we, you know, improve subjects and support people through because I think so much of what, you know, we do online and the way that we write some of uh, these standards, sometimes if it's, if it's vague and people don't know what that looks like in practice or there aren't good examples involved and it can be very hard to achieve the outcome that you want. So I, I think keeping that in mind that uh, part of it is about having some standards that may be aligned to good practice, but it's also about how do we communicate what that looks like and, and what that means. So I found that the Quality Matters Framework and, and rubric had some interesting takeaways from that. So I guess this is a good uh, point to open it up to to the group and ask, well, what can we take from others? Uh, certainly I'm happy to ask, answer any questions uh, that may have popped up within the chat, but uh, I thought it would be a good chance to just find out what other people are doing and, and what you think we can take from some of these approaches around uh, either developing standards and policies that uh, align technology to staff capacity to pedagogy and to uh, sustainable solutions or, or ways of implementing that that are um, going to be positive and, and lead to the sort of outcomes we want. Uh, and even, I guess that then raises the question of, of what are the outcomes that we want. So that's that's me done. Thanks, Thanks Kate. That was, that was great. Every, this is, yeah, this has been really fantastic. Um, so rather than me banging on, um, do we have questions in the chat? Um, if anyone wants to turn their mic on and ask a question, please feel free. Um, I'm pretty sure that all works. Uh, otherwise, yeah, just post in the chat. That's good too. All right. Um, I guess, <laughs> having said that I wasn't going to bang on um, in the absence, I, I will. Um, I guess for me, the biggest question in all of these things is, yes, we can absolutely see the benefits and there's certainly a lot of room in our institutions for, um, you know, supporting, um, you know, kind of raising overall standards. Um, how do we actually motivate um, the academics to participate in this kind of practice? What do they, what do they get out of it? Why, um, why should they do it in, you know, sort of fairly cold, hard, pragmatic terms? Um, I'm happy to take a, um, I'm happy to answer that one slightly. I'm happy to understand, put, put their two cents in too. Um, my two cents in that one. Um, essentially, look, um, why do academics do it? Well, it's for the students, all right? You know, the students are here. They enrol into our uh, units, our courses. We do it for the students in a sense. We want to give them quality education, a, a good experience at, um, at university, essentially. And we, we are always needing to improve what we do going forward. We can't just stay, stay still. 
it's competitive out there and and I can only see that all the work that we're doing we're genuinely doing this for the students to give them a better experience better education in university one thing I also would like to uh, Tom Cotton here from La Trobe Uni um, one thing I'd also like to contribute to that point is um, helping the academics share their passion for their subjects and sharing that subjects with their students um, work through one subject redesign and you know that was a big benefit for them to one look at their materials with fresh eyes but to really refine how they communicate with these online tools and systems um, that was a very powerful motivator for the academic that I worked with. Cheers. I, I think Leanne's um, right in that it is competitive out there in that uh, most staff understand that most unis these days ex have a certain expectation of um, you know what's offered to students but there's also a, I guess um, competition uh, it's competitive out there also just in terms of for potentially for academics in uh, retaining roles within institutions in that uh, you do need to be seen to be uh, you know staying abreast of what's happening and mm. and looking to improve and looking to uh, stay competitive as well and you know given that uh, the workforce is pretty <laughs> uh, you know unstable now. Yeah. Yeah, Kate, I'm just wanting to add to that as well. Like part of my experience you know, with that Deacon and working with a lot of academics and staff members here, I can genuinely say that every single academic here anyways in the Faculty of Business and elsewhere as well, I used to work in Central, that they genuinely want to do better. They want to help. They want to improve. Everyone wants to do that. And your comment earlier, Katie, about not sure how much could we get done without that high level support. Yes, yeah, high level support is absolutely crucial. They bring in the resources and that's why, and, and, and I do bang on about support and scaffolded support and resources, it's key. You, you know, with any organisation or higher education, if the leaders out, out there don't give us the resources and support structures to help our academics, you know, it's very limited. It's a very hard task to do. It's climbing up a mountain without, you know, um, with, with, you know, wind pushing down, strongly down. So leadership, resources, support, and like I said, every single academic, I believe, genuinely want to improve. So it's one of those things where with us, it's not that, it hasn't been that difficult for us at Deakin. Because, yeah, with that mindset in mind. Um, Leanne or, or anybody else, do you think that, um, you know, we're talking about leadership support, but uh, support for, I guess, in allowing, you know, encouraging staff to take up technologies or support that's, you know, provided by teams uh, to enable academics to improve or, or integrate uh, technology is, is one thing, but support can also be about, taking things away in terms of uh, allow, giving people time or uh, recognising um, teaching, you know, so much of what uh, unis generally recognise in terms of career progression is around research rather than teaching practice and I guess I'm just wondering about whether uh, those are areas that maybe can help free up ac academic time or, or allow for better recognition or incentive, I don't know. Um, I don't think I want to go near the research and um, teaching nexus at the moment because we all know that research is important <laughs> priority across most higher education. But I can say that for us, um, teaching is very, you know, teaching is well respected at Deakin across Deakin overall. And in terms of the support, I mean, you did mention a bit about support. We do have um, initiatives, things in place where our senior ma managers understand that if you're going to go and trial something new in digital technologies or what it is in your units or course, they understand if things don't turn, you know, 
uh, turn out right or it's not successful, etc. So we have an evaluation system for every single unit and some units can be exempt if they're going to try out something new. We have award systems in, in place across the university to award staff members. So, um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I'm being very positive at Deakin. I mean, I think, I think we have it really good here at Deakin and, and hopefully Chia and um, Jan and etc. agrees as well. But uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think we have it pretty good here. Yeah, and, and this is one of the reasons that we sort of looked at, you know, we, we've sort of set up this group is because there's a lot of different things going on at the universities, you know, sort of around Australia and everything. Um, we don't necessarily hear these kind of stories. So I, I'm really grateful um, for you coming, Leanne, and, and also Kate for, for sharing everything. Um, so I'm just mindful of, of time. Um, so I, I think this has been fantastic. It's really great to see as many people come to this first uh, webinar as there has been uh, and um, people signing up to the group and doing everything else. Um, I guess I have one final question to think about, um, which kind of follows on from the question on the slide, is, is, is where do we go from here? What else can we do with this information and these ideas? Like, do we just kind of stop at this point and say, well, that was interesting? Or, um, I don't know, like, I mean, I'm, I think I'm going to dig into the Western Sydney stuff and um, we'll share um, other documents. So um, I've added the Western Sydney documents to the Tell Advisors site. Um, there's also a discussion forum um, that's on there now, just with a quick post. Um, does anyone have any other thoughts on what we might do with this? And Twitter. You don't have to um, have all of the um, ideas now, I guess. So, and that's kind of the, the strength of having the discussion forum. But yeah, like I, I think it would be fantastic. This, like, I think there's a lot still to be done in this space um, and I'd be really interested in sort of doing more work here if anyone else is. Um, and otherwise, um, yeah, I guess I'd just like to thank Leanne and Kate and obviously Chie and um, everyone for sort of helping make this um, first session happen and obviously everyone who's come along and participated. So thank you. Thanks, and I'll Colin. I'll stop the recording. Um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I think there's already a lot of stuff out there. That What came up through just looking through different unis is that there's a lot of, even through some organisations as well, that there's a lot of existing uh, work that's been done and a lot of existing resources available freely on the web. So if we can share things uh, amongst, you know, our groups, then I think that really helps. Um, it means people don't have to reinvent the wheel. So, yeah, thanks again, guys.